Thank you, Bishop Hartmeyer, uh, on behalf of the diocese for uh, organizing this. And uh, Joe Stong, I don't know where you are, but uh, for your office and all that you've done to, uh, to pull this together. I, um, I don't want to waste a second, so I'm just going to get started. I got about seven points, but they won't be long. First, the religious diversity of this nation is amazing. Think about all of the religions from all over the world that are right here in this United States. And think about how many of them are right here in Savannah. We've got everything from a beautiful cathedral to a religious community living on a boat down on the river. All right here in this community. Reflect for just a moment on what it might mean for any government entity to try to please all of us various religious faiths. I mean, we don't even agree with ourselves internally. <laughs> Methodists don't all agree with other Methodists. Catholics don't all agree with other Catholics. Somehow or other, though, we want the government at any level to please all of us. I mean, they've got a very difficult job. Maybe Constantine could pull it off, but I'm not sure anybody since then has been able to do that. This idea of benign neutrality. It's a wonderful theory. Second, discerning religious liberty is a messy process. I cannot stress that enough. We have been working on it in this country for 400 years, and we're still not exactly sure what it means, uh, even since that time when Roger Williams was exiled to Rhode Island. There are few clear lines to really tell us what it means to have religious liberty. Certainly we have the First Amendment to the Constitution, but that still leaves a lot of room for generous flexibility. Various Supreme Courts have tried to draw clear lines, but their lines have ended up being not any clearer than they were um, previously. For instance, can Native Americans use peyote in their religious ceremonies? Must Amish buggies display reflective devices when they are riding on the public highways? Can we force Jehovah's Witnesses to commit idolatry by pledging allegiance to the flag? Must churches obey noise ordinances when their praise bands grow too rambunctious? <laughs> are these issues of religious liberty? Or are they issues of zoning, public safety, patriotism, and drug use. Religious liberty is messy. Third, the religious community must speak with restraint and respect. We must resist assigning evil, demonic, or satanic intent to those who see issues differently from us. Nor should we too quickly assume that our opponents are conducting a war on religion. The United States is the most religious nation in the world. And those who decry that every skirmish is Armageddon are creatively connecting the dots. A March 2012 survey indicates that only 38% of Americans believe that religious liberty is being threatened in this country. Maybe militaristic language is being used to whip up the troops. Fourth, the religious community is understandably wary of the state seizing too much power. We do not want the state defining or circumscribing our practices or our habits. Frankly, I think most of the time the state is not interested either in umpiring uh, over us. 
For instance, when churches get in arguments with each other about who owns the property, and they try to go to court, the court runs as fast as they can in the other direction, saying, we don't want to touch that one. I don't think the state always wants to be an umpire. We know the government can get things wrong. Somebody has already mentioned uh, our government trying to say to some church uh, what their standards of ordination should be. What was our government thinking? The Supreme Court overturned that nine to nothing. Think about it. Sotomayor, Thomas, Scalia, Kagan, all on the same side of an issue? Those nine to nothing decisions happen far more often than five to four decisions in the Supreme Court. Fifth, religious bodies can be just as prone as the government to an abuse of power. It would be equally dicey in our country if we let religious bodies call all of the shots about what was religious liberty. Just because a certain group cries religious liberty doesn't make it so. The church has made horrible decisions over the years. We have been on the wrong side of justice and righteousness. And sometimes, shamefully, we in the church or other religious bodies have gone to court so that we could get ourselves in position of favor over other churches and other bodies. Sometimes, sadly not often enough, the government has been the only institution that has stood up for persecuted religious minorities. Sixth, sometimes the issue is not religious liberty at all, even though somebody says it is. It may be a public policy issue. The Constitution guarantees freedom of religion in the First Amendment, but the very first sentence of the Constitution says that the government should provide for the common welfare. So is it an issue of public policy or an issue of religious liberty? That's precarious and sometimes holding the two in tension is trickier than Carl Walinda's recent walk across <laughs> Niagara Falls. And then these most contentious issues, and we do have them with our government, the most contentious church-state issues involve government money. And there's always messiness when you start getting into that intersection. And then frankly, the other thing that rubs us all the wrong way is that uh, it's not only government money and public money and private faith, but it, usually the intersection is at controversial issues like abortion, contraception, and uh, human sexuality, over which we in the church ourselves are still arguing about. In the matter of our government's proposed contraceptives guidelines, I believe the government has fallen off the tightrope while trying to please multiple constituencies in our nation. They did it poorly, but they did not do it out of spiteful intent. I believe if the matter eventually gets to the Supreme Court and the fact of the Supreme Court's ruling last week does not uh, make a difference in this lawsuit. I believe that if the matter eventually does get to the Supreme Court, that it will eventually be overturned in something somewhat like a nine to nothing slam dunk. The government does not want to umpire, and I think eventually the Supreme Court, if it goes that far, will rule that the government has uh, fallen off on the wrong side on this one. <clears throat> Seventh, the religious sector doesn't win every issue. We don't get to win every issue. <clears throat> Earlier this year, for instance, Catholics and Methodists in Alabama joined forces to sue the state of Alabama 
because of their new immigration law over there. It is a law that everybody, even those who wrote it, said it's the harshest law in the nation. We Methodists and Catholics said, yeah, it is. It's so harsh that, uh, um, getting back to some of what Kat was talking about earlier, we don't believe that we could feed people. You, you mean, you're going to arrest us because we're feeding people whether they're here legally or illegally, and, and you can't do that to us. We sued in court, and we lost. The courts upheld the law, and uh, I still disagree with the uh, Alabama law, but the court spoke. Nobody wins all the time. 